September 1978, serial killer Rodney Alcala appears on the dating game. February 1994, 34 hospital workers are exposed to an unexplained toxic lady. March 2022, Experian emails a Los Angeles podcaster about a mysterious credit score change, completely unjustified. Wait, and did we cover that? I mean, we could have. I said it was mysterious. Okay, we're Ghost Town and we cover true crime, paranormal, and other weird history. The cult of Capital One. <laughs> But here's one more date. July 2018, a trailer drops for a new podcast called Ghost Town. Over 300 episodes later, we've covered everything from the Los Feliz murder house to the Noid. Ever hear of the Tetris murders or the Denver Spider-Man or the underground satanic magazine Tuesday's Child? Didn't think so. We've got stories you won't hear anywhere else by two writers, producers, and comedians. We're LA 4s, but Wisconsin 7s. Hey, I'm from Wisconsin. Oh. I'm Rebecca Lieb. I'm Jason Horton. And this is Ghost Town. Available every Wednesday and Friday. Pause the podcast you're listening to right now and subscribe to Ghost Town. Wherever you get your podcasts. You're a Wisconsin 8. Hmm. Southern Gothic is a podcast that explores the history behind some of the American South's darkest days greatest mysteries, and most chilling ghost stories. In the early hours of March 20th, 1897, Reverend Lee of Newport, Kentucky, was admitted into the Campbell County Jail to meet with a pair of men who had been convicted of murder and were sentenced to hang. Solemnly, the three men prayed, and together they sang several hymns, the sweet by and by, God be with you till we meet again, and the half was never told. The minister then offered another prayer, and what followed was a series of events in which Alonzo Walling begged Scott Jackson to admit that he was not guilty of the crime that they had been convicted of, a murder that even after they both confessed in court, they continued to claim their innocence of. For a brief bit of time, this seemed to work. Jackson told the sheriff that he would do as Walling asked. So at 8.55, a telegraph was sent to the governor saying simply, Walling is not guilty of this crime, I am. Signed, Scott Jackson. Unfortunately, the statement did little to sway the governor. At 10.15, Governor Bradley sent word to Sheriff Plummer that the execution of both men was to proceed if Jackson did not provide a more detailed confession, but he refused. So, about an hour later, the sheriff walked out to the gallows and addressed a crowd of several hundred people who'd gathered to watch the hanging. Gentlemen, he said, I want to ask you all that while this execution is taking place to observe the utmost quiet, any remarks or statements of any kind will be improper, and I ask you not to make any expressions of any kind, although you may not agree with the law. It is my sad duty to have to perform the extreme penalty and I would ask that you would show all reverence that ought to be shown in the presence of death. The men were then marched out of the jail and up the scaffold to take their places on the trap doors. And once they were settled, the sheriff gave them one more chance to give a statement, fulfilling the governor's wishes. Have you, Scott Jackson, have anything to say? Without even turning his head, Jackson stated clearly, Only this, I am not guilty of the crime with which I am now supposed to pay the penalty by my life. Then Walling was called upon, to which he stammered out, Nothing to say, only you are about to take the life of an innocent man. I call upon God to be my witness. Since no confession took place, the sheriff called the reverend forward for one final prayer, before a noose was slipped around each of their necks. And at 11.41, the sheriff gave the final signal to his deputy. A loud crash erupted as the trap doors opened 
and the men shot downward. Unfortunately, this was not a clean hanging. The noose's knot failed to break their neck, so the unfortunate soul struggled for several minutes before succumbing to death in front of an eager crowd. Following their execution, a black flag was hoisted for everyone in town to see that the deed had been done. Scott Jackson and Alonzo Walling had been hanged for the murder of a young woman. A violent act done in a manner so gruesome that the story of it has continued to be told over a century later. A heartbreaking tale of a young woman who trusted men whom she should not have. A woman named Pearl Bryan. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. It was a chilly February day in 1896 when Johnny Hewling, a young farm worker, made a grisly discovery on the land of his employer, John Locke, near Fort Thomas, Kentucky. Hauling had stumbled upon the remains of a woman lying on the slope of a ravine with her feet resting higher than her body. But to the young man's horror, What he found when he approached was that this was not just any corpse. The woman was decapitated and her head was missing. So the police were called to investigate. The victim was dressed in a light blue checkered dress over a dark blue skirt, and she wore one piece union suit underwear. As you might expect, her attire was disheveled so the police initially suspected that she may have been sexually assaulted before her murder. But they soon found that this was not the case, although there had undoubtedly been a struggle, as she also wore tan-colored kid gloves that had been sliced open by a blade of some kind, and there were wounds on her back and hands, indicating that she had fought back against her attacker. But most disturbingly of all, it was determined that this young woman had still been alive at the time of her decapitation. This gruesome detail was confirmed by the doctor who performed the autopsy. He reported, quote, Her head was taken away, horrible as it may seem, merely to prevent the identification of her body. Since the remains were discovered not far from Fort Thomas, the police assumed that the victim was a local sex worker or a dance hall girl, and that the killer was probably a soldier stationed there. But when they inquired around town, they found nothing, as authorities soon learned that no working women were missing. Fortunately, a lead developed from a surprising source, a local shoe store. News of the brutal murder had spread rapidly throughout the area in the country. After all, the mystery of the victim's identity captivated the attention of the public. And since folks were desperate to identify her, reports included detailed descriptions of her clothing, the only real evidence that the police had. Luckily, it worked. Louis D. Pook, a local shoe store owner, noticed a detail in these descriptions that others might have missed as mundane or trivial. The petite cloth top boots worn by the victim were an unusual size. They were marked as 3B, which is equivalent to a modern American woman's four or four and a half. Further investigation found that the shoes also had an imprint from a store located in Greencastle, Indiana, as well as a number that Pook identified as a manufacturer's lot number. Using his connections, 
Pook was able to verify that only a single pair of size 3B boots of that style had been sent to that particular store. Now, as you can imagine, the police weren't exactly enthusiastic about following a lead based on a pair of shoes. But the man was persistent, and on February 4th, several detectives made their way to the Lewis and Hayes Shoe Store in Greencastle, Indiana. There, a search of the store's books revealed exactly what they had been looking for. Only several months prior, in September, the shoes were purchased by a young woman named Pearl Bryan. The girl's family was then brought in, and her identity was confirmed by the clothing she was wearing at the time of her death. But what made this murder even more tragic was that when this unmarried 22 or 23-year-old woman was murdered, she was five months pregnant. As if word of this horrible crime hadn't already captivated folks from all over, the story of Pearl Bryan was now spreading like wildfire. Papers across the country dedicated countless column inches to the particularly heinous nature of the murder and the shocking details that surrounded it. Unfortunately, the sensationalist character of the media meant that the story of Pearl's murder and who she was as a person was often written and presented to fit a particular narrative that wasn't exactly true. Shaping the image of Pearl as a poor, innocent farm girl who was seduced and ruined by a dishonorable man. But Pearl wasn't the poor farm girl that was being written about. In fact, her father, Alexander Bryan, was a successful stock breeder and dairy operator. The Bryan family was even part of the local social elite, and Pearl herself was a high school graduate and a music student at DePaul University. Pearl was educated and ambitious and even taught Sunday school. Newspapers didn't care about that, though. Instead, they painted Pearl as an unsophisticated and uneducated girl. Now, this likely was just bias, but it is suggested that it might be due to the clothing she was found in, a hand-me-down house dress from her sister that wasn't considered suitable for wearing out in public. In reality, though, Pearl worked at her sister's dress shop, and her job was to make sure that they always had the latest fashions. So what Pearl was wearing on that fateful day wasn't really an indication of her social standing. Rather, it actually suggests that she wasn't planning on going out in public when the events leading to her murder began to unfold. But while Pearl Bryan was known as bright and vivacious, she did have her secrets. Obviously, one of the biggest mysteries surrounding the murder was who was the father of her child. After her pregnancy was discovered, most assumed that whoever this man was was surely the person who committed the crime. After all, he had the most likely motive. But while Pearl was said to have been popular with men, she didn't have a regular suitor. Although, two men were quickly identified as the most likely, William Wood and Scott Jackson. William Wood was Pearl's second cousin, and the pair were so close that initially the Bryan family and even the Greencastle community believed that William might be the father. But William denied any romantic involvement whatsoever, yet he did admit that he was aware of the pregnancy. Wood claimed that on January 28, 1896, he escorted Bryan to the train station. She said she was going to travel to Indianapolis to visit a friend, but instead, 
went to Cincinnati for an abortion. In spite of this, William wasn't ever really considered to be a suspect for her murder, although it's very likely that he's the one who introduced Pearl to Scott Jackson. Jackson was several years older than Brian. He came from a wealthy family and moved to Greencastle the year before from New Jersey after turning state's evidence in an embezzlement investigation. The Bryan family knew of the blossoming relationship between Pearl and Scott and even permitted Pearl to spend time with him, hesitantly allowing her to join him when he was home from school and spend time alone together in their parlor in the evenings. Brian's parents had every confidence in Pearl, and even knowing Jackson's past, they lacked suspicion of any malicious intentions or bad influence that he may have had over their daughter. But when it was discovered that Jackson was studying dentistry in Cincinnati and had kept a correspondence with Pearl, he immediately became the primary suspect in the investigation. It was from that point forward that the press almost always explicitly identified Scott Jackson as the father of Pearl Bryan's unborn child, whether it was true or not. Yet it is here that stories diverge and intermingle between storytelling and assumptions, as well as alibis and defenses. Many articles claim that Scott Jackson lured Pearl to Cincinnati on the promise that they would marry, but instead of doing so, he killed her to hide the whole affair. This suspicion grew even more when the Courier Journal published a letter that the dental student sent to Pearl, which purportedly came with a prescription for a mixture of ingredients that could be used to induce a miscarriage. It said that when this concoction didn't work, Jackson told Pearl to come and see him in Cincinnati. And when she did, she was never seen alive again. So as you can expect, it didn't take long for Scott Jackson to be arrested and charged with the murder of Pearl Bryan, an accusation he vehemently denied. We'll discuss what happened next, the mystery that continues on to this very day, and more after the break. Scott Jackson's arrest marked a crucial turning point in the investigation into Pearl Bryan's murder. Initially, Jackson denied any involvement, but eventually he admitted that he had in fact arranged an abortion for Pearl. But it wasn't because he was the father. It was a favor for his friend, Will Wood, whom he believed had gotten Pearl pregnant. Wood, of course, denied the claim, accusing Jackson of seducing his cousin. But not long after his arrest, Jackson's story changed. This time, he implicated his roommate, Alonzo Walling, for the murder, alleging that Walling was supposed to arrange for the abortion and that he had left Pearl in his care on the Wednesday before she died. So Walling was arrested as well, but he claimed that he never made the Wednesday appointment and never even saw Pearl, insisting that Scott Jackson was the killer. He told police that Jackson even admitted to him the plan, that he was going to lure Pearl to Cincinnati on the pretext of the procedure, but instead, he'd poison her and cut her up into pieces that he'd then dispose of in outhouse vaults around the city. Of course, Jackson denied this too, and since the police weren't able to extract a confession from either of the men, they were forced to build a circumstantial case based on the testimony of witnesses who saw Pearl 
during the final week of her life. On the Wednesday that both men claimed they saw her for the last time, a salesman at Hockett Brothers Pianos in Cincinnati named Smith Von Fossen said Pearl came into the shop. He reported that when she left the store, he saw her meet a man on the street. Then, on Thursday, Pearl visited a spiritualist, Mrs. Plymouth Weeks. The woman reported that she came for a reading and was accompanied by a man she called Doc. Doc was Scott Jackson's nickname. Finally, on Friday night, someone reported that Jackson, Wally, and Pearl were all seen together at Wallingford Saloon on George Street. Both men were known at the establishment, and both the owner and his porter claimed that Jackson came in with a blonde woman. Alonzo Walling arrived later, but the three left together in a horse-drawn cab driven by a third man. Unfortunately, they couldn't identify the driver, so several newspapers offered large rewards for his identity, and a man named George Jackson came forward. George was a black man with no known relation to Scott Jackson, but he claimed that someone approached him and offered him $10 to drive a doctor and his patient across the bridge to Kentucky. George agreed, and the woman and Scott Jackson rode in the cab while Alonzo Walling sat beside him. George said that at one point, he heard a commotion going on inside the cab, but when he attempted to quit the job, Walling pulled a pistol out and ordered him on. He told the police that when they reached the destination, the pair emerged, but the woman was barely able to walk by herself. He then fled back to Cincinnati on foot after the men disappeared into the woods with the woman. Finally, the police had the testimony they needed, and on April 21st, 1896, Scott Jackson was tried for the murder of Pearl Bryan. It lasted several weeks, and on May 14th, the jury came back with a decisive answer. Scott Jackson was guilty. Alonzo Walling's trial commenced the following week, and he too was found guilty. During these trials, the men's defense argued an alternative story of Pearl Bryan's death. They claimed it was the result of a botched abortion, performed at the home of a doctor on George Street in Cincinnati. Alonzo Walling's attorney assembled a collection of witnesses prepared to testify to this. One of those men was William Trusty. Trusty claimed that he drove the body of Pearl Bryan from the doctor's residence to Locks Farm in Kentucky. But the police were suspicious of the claim, and before the trials began, they discovered that Seward fabricated and coached his witnesses. So when they were threatened with perjury, many refused to testify. But William Trusty had no idea they were threatened with perjury, and he told his story of relocating Pearl's body in court anyway. He was then charged with perjury, and to make matters even worse, he decided to skip bail and attempted to flee. Ultimately, he was captured and convicted, but the entire time he maintained that although Seward had pushed for some elaborations, his story of moving Pearl's body was in fact true. Either way, both Jackson and Walling were convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to hang. The pair made an attempt to appeal the verdict, but after that failed, their only hope for mercy was to make some type of confession in the hope that they may be pardoned by the governor. So on March 18th, 1897, they were put into a room with a table and chairs and given pencils and papers and left to write their confessions. In their individual statements, they told virtually the same story. Pearl Bryan arrived in Cincinnati for the sole purpose of having an abortion. Walling contacted his girlfriend at the time, May Smith, to provide him with a name and arrange contact with an abortionist. That man was Dr. George Wagner, 
of Bellevue, Kentucky. Then, on the Wednesday in question, Walling met with Pearl and provided her directions to the doctor's home, and she traveled there on her own. The next day, the men followed, delivering her bag to her at the doctor's. Finally, on Friday, the operation was set to take place. Complications purportedly arose from the very start, so the doctor gave Pearl some whiskey and injected her with ergot, but the medication provided no relief, and soon after, the doctor proclaimed that Pearl had died. The men said that the three of them then loaded Pearl's body into a vehicle and took it to a secluded spot where the doctor removed the poor woman's head with a dissecting knife before wrapping it in her cloak. These confessions pleased no one. Not only did neither of the convicted men admit guilt, but they also implicated a prominent Bellevue physician. Yet when the confessions were made public, they gained some credibility. May Smith came forward and confirmed she procured the doctor at Walling's request, and the local druggist confirmed that he had filled a prescription for Dr. Wagner for ergot on the night of January 31st, 1896. There were, of course, doubts to this, though. May Smith wasn't a new name in the case. She had previously come forward claiming that she received letters from Scott Jackson admitting his guilt before recanting the story the next day. So, as you can imagine, she was considered too unreliable to testify for either the defense or the prosecution. As for Dr. Wagner, there had been rumors of his involvement prior to the trials, but he could never be subpoenaed to testify because after Pearl's remains were discovered, the doctor was committed to the Eastern Kentucky Asylum for the Insane. Obviously, the governor was unmoved by the confessions, particularly since they contradicted previously provided testimony. And so on the morning of March 20th, 1897, Scott Jackson and Alonzo Walling were hanged. The two men proclaimed their innocence until the very end. As for poor Pearl Bryan, despite all efforts, her head was never found. The two men had given several answers. One was that it was at the bottom of the Ohio River, and another that it was hidden in a handlebar in the river near Dayton, Kentucky. Some also theorized that they may have burned it in the furnace of the dental college, but no one will ever know and Pearl Bryan was forced to be buried without it. She was laid to rest in her family's plot in Forest Hill Cemetery in Greencastle, Indiana. Between the gruesome nature of the crime and the story of a seduced and then betrayed woman, it's perhaps unsurprising that the murder of Pearl Bryan achieved significant notoriety at the time promoted with that stereotypical claim, crime of the century. Fascination with the case grew to such wild proportions that people even flocked to the crime scene to take souvenirs of anything that could be discovered. Items that may have had blood on it, the ground clay itself was eagerly seized, and someone even found strands of Pearl's blonde hair that may have been snagged on a branch or stuck in the mud. Even when heavy rain fell, relic hunters were not deterred. One local store even got in on the zeal by selling Pearl Bryan merchandise, and women from all over sent love letters to the jailed suspects. In the end, though, most know about the case today due to the murder ballad folk song that memorialized it. Versions of this song started to pop up as early as the 1910s, but the first recording came in 1926 with country singer Vernon Dahlhart. That same year, folk singer Bradley Kincaid recorded his own version, titled Pearl Bryan. While this song never quite had the success of other murder ballads that we've discussed, like the Ballad of the Lawson Family, it has become one of the heiress 
most infamous. It has been over a century since Pearl Bryan's death, but today, her memory lives on due to the massive newspaper coverage of the time. Unfortunately, one mystery remains. Where did these men put Pearl Bryan's head? And can she ever truly rest in peace without it? My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independent podcast produced by siblings Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider. If you're a fan of the show and would like more content, be sure to join us over on Patreon or become a premium subscriber on the Apple Podcast app. There, you'll receive access to both ad-free and monthly bonus episodes. This show is also a member of Airwave Media, a podcast network that features some of the leading storytellers in audio entertainment including other chart-topping podcasts like Redacted History and Historical Blindness. For more info on Southern Gothic, be sure to visit southerngothicmedia.com today. And as always, thanks for listening. Lucky Lady Shacks.